The Ring 2002, directed by Gore Verbinski, written by Aaron Kruger, music by Hans Zimmer, very famous composer. Yes. Uh, made for a budget of $48 million, Holy uh, U.S. Shit. dollars. It made $249.3 million U.S. dollars at the box office. That is a huge Yeah, over $200 million. Holy shit. <laughs> There's a... I'm surprised this didn't get more sequels in America as much as this fucking made, but the sequel bombs are kind of, yeah. so I mean, maybe that's the reason. Uh, Naomi Watts, uh, speaking of principal players, uh, plays Rachel in this. She's the Rocco stand-in, investigative journalist, uh, single mother, and too curious for her own good. Also too hot for this movie, but <laughs> we'll get into that. Uh, Mulholland Drive, uh, Birdman, uh, she was in Tank Girl. I'm really surprised by that. Like, I don't remember her being in that. I just remember Lori Petty from that movie. Yeah. Dude, Birdman was a uh, hell of a good movie. I've watched part of it, but I really need to go back and watch it. I mean, of course, that's another Michael Keaton film. So, yeah. I mean, I'm automatically interested, but I like the the gist of it. Like, it's, you know, him going kind of like psychotic oh, yeah. in a sense and, I'm, you know, going, seeing his character in real life. <laughs> going bonkers. Uh, she was in the 2005 King Kong from Peter Jackson, and she was in twin, the Twin Peaks TV show, the 2017 version, you know, the, the one that they came back with. She was in that. Um, Martin Henderson plays Noah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who is uh, n- not this Noah, uh, who's the Ryuji stand-in, professor, divorced husband, Rachel, and he's a supernatural skeptic in this film. Instead of him being psychic, he just doesn't believe in any of this bullshit. Uh, which sells a lot easier in this film. Yeah. It's a lot easier to buy. And it, I don't know. I like it better because he has the arc in this movie where he has to buy into it, you know? Yeah. And then when he does, then he gets like, he's like, shit, we've got to, we're running out of time now. I've wasted too much time on this. Um, he was in smoking aces. Uh, he was in the Britney Spears video toxic uncredited. He was her boyfriend in that. I just find that hilarious. Uh, He wasn't her boyfriend. Wasn't he just the guy that got like, she rubbed her butt on. Yeah. Well, it, it, that's what it said. Whenever I researched it, maybe that, you know, they got it wrong, but I mean, he was a guy giving a toxic tongue. (laughs) (laughs) He was in The Stranger's Prey at Night, which I don't know. I go back on, you know, as far as, like, whether that's a decent movie or a piece of shit. Like, what I've movie? alternated what movie on my views that? on that. The Stranger's Prey at Night. It was, like, the sequel to The Stranger's. It has a really good soundtrack because it's all 80s, but, like, I don't know. It's a it's a different – it's not like The Stranger. You know, The Stranger's, that home invasion movie where yeah, those yeah, people yeah. just, like, they're in the – you know, this one's just straight-up slasher. Like, they're, they're – you know, it's, it's almost like – Texas Chainsaw Massacre family, you know, like out in public type, you know, thing or they something. They do a good job of executing it or? Uh, it's fairly well done. The kills are good. It's just, I don't know. It's, I don't know. There At the time, I just felt like it was, it's, you're basically watching them. It's, it's almost like the hills have eyes in a sense because you see them do all this damage up front and then the tables get turned halfway through the movie and then the family who they've been her harassing the ones that are left go psychotic and they turn the tables on the, the strangers and like kill them in gruesome ways. So it's one of those type movies. I like um, movies like that. You, you, yeah, the, you, it, you know, one of my favorite movies that's kind of something like that, but it, it all plays in the benefit of the bad person is a uh, high tension. Oh, high tension is great, but high tension has a twist. I'm not going to reveal it on here because you have to watch it, but that, that I love that twist in that movie. Oh yeah. It's hella good. <laughs> Uh, and Martin Henderson was in a 2022 uh, film that I actually enjoy quite a bit, which is Ty West X film. The one that we've discussed a little bit on here about where they're filming a porno next to these old folks. And then, you know, they, uh, oh, yeah. start to die. what's he, it called? He, he, it's just X is the name. Yeah. Of it. I, I watched that uh, a couple weeks ago. It was actually a pretty good Did movie. You- I, I enjoyed it. There's a lot of people that that's like, what? The, why do you like this? This is shit. I'm like, I it's think a it's slasher hilarious. movie. I, 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 it's, I thought it was a good slasher movie. It is. I mean, it's got a lot of throwbacks to older films like Psycho references, The Shining. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, he plays like Matthew McConaughey character in this. Like, there's people that swear up and down that this that Martin Henderson is Matthew McConaughey because just the way he acts and like the accent he puts on in the film because it's set in Texas or whatever. I mean, he um, there's definitely <laughs> resemblances for sure, especially because uh, I did go look up uh, the toxic video and he he matured in a way from this movie 
that he resembled uh, Matthew McConaughey a little bit more. He he does resemble him quite a bit in the movie. It's kind of funny. It's like you're watching it, but you know, it's I don't know. I was just like, okay, that's what everybody says. He's like uh, a poor man's Matthew McConaughey. Is what I've heard him yeah. called in the the movie X. Um. We've got David Dorfman, who's played in Aiden, uh, the Yoichi stand-in, uh, creepy-ass fucking kid. Yeah. Uh, the, the son of Rachel Noah. This kid, I got to get it playing out right now. This kid is too fucking ugly to be the son of Martin Henderson <laughs> and no- Naomi Watts. I'm yes, sorry. but he does resemble but... at least Noah. Uh... He does. <laughs> Like there's a there's a he there's might. a part in the film where they're looking at each other because they're in the car they're having a dad son talk, and I'm like this kid is like an uglier version of his dad for sure. Yeah, but there I don't know I I mean I know that pretty people can make ugly kids but I mean I don't buy it I just I don't he and he hey, we've seen some ugly too. ass parents that have had some pretty cute kids I get fucking it's yeah, weird well, can, you never I know can see the the genetics combining because that would be natural selection you want them, your kids need to be better looking than you so they can procreate better, <laughs> you know, but they're not, I mean, if they're uglier and dumber, then what's that helping anybody, you know? Uh, oh my God, this poor kid. <laughs> uh, but he's just fucking creepy. And I don't know, I mean, I guess it's a good thing that they just have him stare and they don't talk very much because I don't get that he's a great child actor. So, you know, not that the kid, and, you know, played Yoichi in the Japanese version is that great either. They just make, basically keep him mute, but, you know, yeah. he's just a cute old Japanese kid, you know. The, I don't know, this kid, uh, it's probably better that he just, you know, was just kind of there through most of it. Um, He was in The Ring 2. He's actually in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003 film, the the remake with Jessica Bill, and uh, he was in Joan of Arcadia. That's the, some of his uh, credits to his name. Uh, we have Ambler T- uh, Amber Tamblin playing Katie, who's the Tomoko stand-in. Uh, she's Rachel's niece, the first victim of the curse uh, tape that we see in the film, and she's the first Rictus grin, which we got to get into that. This movie, the, I, this Rictus grin is way more effective than the fucking shit in the original movie. Oh, like, yeah, and I didn't know it had a name, Rictus <laughs> grin. I didn't, I've never heard of that. Yeah, just that that creepy Joker like mask that they yeah, have, that, their, you know, that their face, you know, that, that's a shock in the movie when you first see that. It's only yes. for a quick second, but it, it works. Yes, um, for the the official r- uh, review of my from my daughter who had seen it was, it's cool, <laughs> which means it's fucking amazing. Yeah, because she plays everything down because she's one of those teenagers. She can't, she can't be enthusiastic about things. You get it's, two uh, ratings from Nona. Either it's cool or it sucked. So uh, <laughs> no in between. It sucked basically means hot garbage, as uh, Benny likes to say. And uh, it's cool means it was the fucking best. So That's, that's, that's good. Um, she was also in Joan of Arcadia, and I believe that there's like some trivia about like she plays the babysitter to uh, – to David Dorfman in both Joan of Arcadia and in this movie, which is kind of weird. Like she got typecast in that role. Um, um, Amber Tamblin was a little hot in this film. Like she kind of, I don't know, was growing into herself a little bit. I don't know. She kind of had a bulky teenager look going for a while. And then. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't know much about her. So, I mean, you know, that, I'll, I'll take your word on that. Cause I just had this to go off of. I'm trying to think um, real quick. Hold on. Before we move on, because she was in The Grudge 2 in 2006. Okay, yeah. Yes. So she was yeah. definitely younger in this film. I was getting ready to say, she's one of the few people that's crossed over between the series. She was yeah. in The Grudge 2, so she was she was in both. Um, she was also in The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, whatever. <laughs> and uh, she was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer one episode, so she crossed over in The Grudge 2, and she worked with Sarah Michelle Gellar. You know, and Buffy's technically. So there, there's that crossover with a grudge in a way. Um, one of my favorite actors, Brian Cox, plays <laughs> Richard Morgan in this. Cox. Um, Samara's adoptive father uh, who created the curse. He's a total asshole in this movie. Um, <laughs> uh, this guy's been in a shit ton of movies, like just a ton. A lot of bit parts, but just a ton of them. Uh, Super Troopers, I love him in that. Uh, he was in Braveheart. He was in X2, X-Men United, which is also a movie where he plays a character who lost his wife and daughter and then commits suicide. That's <laughs> a strange link between these movies. Uh, Scooby-Doo and the Samurai Sword. That's kind of interesting, you know. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, the autopsy of Jane Doe, which is fucking amazing. Yeah, I haven't seen watched that movie. it. That's you told me to watch it. Oh my hell god, good horror so movie. good. That's a good ass horror movie. <laughs> That is, you talk about tension and atmosphere. That, that movie does is 100%. it. Percent. Yeah, because it's in an enclosed environment. It's really, it. That's a hell of a good movie. They they take every bit of that budget and the and the actors they've got in the setting and they work it to the nth degree. Like this is a master class of how to make a scary movie. Yeah, big time. Is that a ghost story is it kind a of. zombie it's kind of it's kind of both well i don't it, it's kind of another movie i don't reveal what it is because that that breaks the the twist okay. no 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 that's fine i just like is that because you've would, talked about it, it. is it a later a, it will be in a later season for sure okay I that's guess. what i was gonna say s- okay that's what i was gonna get at okay perfect i'll, I'll go with that um and then trick or treat obviously because he he plays the the bus driver the old that that's which a trivia about Trick or Treat, the 2007 version, the, the Mike Doherty film, which uh, is one of my favorite Halloween movies ever. Uh, he's actually, his character is designed to look like John Carpenter in that film. Oh, well. <laughs> so when you see that ugly ass old man with the long, lanky gray hair, he's supposed to be John Carpenter. <laughs> there you go. Um, we've got Shannon Cochran playing Anna Morgan, uh, a horse enthusiast, uh, Samara's adoptive mother and a co and the co curse creator. Cause she, instead of like the, the other versions, she's like implicated in the fact that she like takes Samara out in this. So yeah. kind of a twist. Um, lots of TV is bit parts. Uh, she was on star Trek nemesis and she did, even did a stint on deep space nine. So she's more of a star Trek person. She's got that look. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, DeVay Chase plays Samara, the Sadako stand Dan, strangely cursed adoptive child whose abilities to imprint images on film and affect others transcends, uh, transcends her death. They don't explain her origin in this movie. She's, it's like a supernatural curse on her in this film. Yeah. If I remember right. Like there's no psychic anything. It's, it, she's, she's just a weird kid that was born that way and they were unlucky enough to adopt her and they've got to deal with it. Um, she was in Donnie Darko. She played his little sister in that movie, Samantha. Um, and she was also in uh, S. Darko, which is the sequel to Donnie Darko. She was in Spirit that Away. She played the. She did the voice in that of uh, the main character. She was Lilo's voice in Lilo and Stitch. Yeah, she she in Spirited Away. I, now that I know she was in Spirited Away, the the two sound the same. <laughs> Uh, it's just, I, I just find that interesting because Spirit of Wake kind of gives me vibes of like a Japanese, you know, like horror movie, like The Ring in a way. So it's kind of, you it know, yeah. funny that she was in both of them. Uh, and she's actually really good in S. Darko. I know a lot of people don't like the sequel to Donnie Darko. It does crawl up its own ass. But, you know, as far as like explaining like why she suddenly has the, the abilities her brother did. But it's it's interesting in some of the stuff. And it's got some cool visuals. I was researching um, her because she, she got hot for a minute. She in S. Darko, she's hot. Like, you know, she's she's good looking in that. I mean, I don't know if she was of age, so I can't really say much other than, you know, that. But she she was very pretty in that movie. Well, yeah, she went from like a kid and then for sure she had her hot years. But then I think she's kind of taken a turn. Since. It's unfortunate. It happened, so. Synopsis for this film, same as Ringu, but American. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Got rid of all that psychic bullshit. Added tons of horses. Because fuck you, that's why. <laughs> and still there's a creepy ghost girl with long, lanky, dark hair. But the most supernatural thing in this movie is how fucking hot Naomi <laughs> Watts is. Even in scenes where it doesn't make any sense for her to be that way. Oh my God. <laughs> Ridiculously hot. <laughs> it's scary hot. Oh, good. She, you- God. There, the scene where she's outside at the funeral and she's like smoking with those other. So oh, yeah. She put every one of those teenage girls to fucking shame. Oh, yeah. I would not have been in a scene with her if I would have been those girls. Like they, she fucking just made them look like dog shit by comparison. They were bullied for the rest of their lives after that. <laughs> like you realize that that woman just like totally looked way hotter than you guys ever will look in your entire life. My biggest problem with her looking that as so as hot as she is in this movie is that she doesn't have any right to be as the character because she's not uh, like a, a she's not a TV journalist, right? She's just a newspaper journalist. Yeah, a one that ke- the, the boss keeps trying to fire, which is 
I'm just like, why is this woman not on the afternoon like TV or like the the news or something? Like, there's no sense that somebody. I mean, unless she just didn't want to do that. I mean, I guess you could make that argument, but like, I it, it does not fit her character at she all. She was busy raising your kid. <laughs> oh wait, she wasn't. They just wanted she to wasn't. give her. They just wanted to give her just enough arc that she could do research to figure out what she needed to figure out. They didn't really care what her job was. I kind of, and I mean, this says a lot about me, but I thought she was super hot in that first scene where she's introducing the movie, where she comes in and the teacher's like trying to give her all this shit about how her son was doing this and doing that. She's just, but she just like, you know, like, listen, lady, I don't give a fuck. You know, I'm busy. You know, you know, she just like no nonsense. Like she was just right there. She's like, listen, I'm, I got shit to do. I can't, you know, he's a, he's, he can take care of himself. You Little know, Timmy's blah, blah, a good blah. kid. I got the feeling that she was just a shit mom that was like, my son can do no wrong. <laughs> she was. She it, was. It's like mean, the Japanese one. Pretty good shit mom. <laughs> oh my God. You know, the Japanese one, she just fucking wasn't around. So she wouldn't have even been at a fucking teacher meeting. She would have been like, yeah, no, fuck that. I mean, you know, they had to get a pretty boy like, you know, the, the you know, guy who played, you know, no, this movie uh to to be able to i mean martin henderson to even halfway i mean because if, if he you know to even hint that you know they created a kid together there's no way you would have believed anybody you know that was like just an average looking guy yeah and he wasn't like i mean he wasn't super i mean you know like hollywood good looks either i mean like it was uh, but he's i mean a, no, he's a good looking guy he's got really nice eyes like he's got beautiful colored eyes and everything he's not ugly by any means but i thought he was also like too good looking for what he was doing like he was too good looking for a college professor that was like or whatever no it wasn't even a college was he a college professor who was just like a video editor Some, i don't he was know in this movie? well because he was kind of a teacher so it's hard to tell but he was dating yeah, one of his students both. as well i don't know i don't think they committed to the in the script somebody got to the point where they were like wait a minute is this guy a professor like an original or is he a video editor because we need him to be a video editor to make sense of you know that why he'd be like you know trying to analyze this film and somebody was like fuck it just roll with it you know yeah um <laughs> but it also makes sense that okay maybe he really was as good looking as he was in his career because he's dating some hot barely legal college student who also does you know, not compare you know to was, naomi right? watson uh yeah uh, wait, wait please but update me because i do know her oh um what's her name uh, uh claire no blair, uh, blair god selma blair am i wrong uh, I won't say that you're wrong because isn't it the, I want to say, isn't it the uh, goth chick off of, um, uh, which show is that? Is it Criminal Minds? I uh, know it's NCIS. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, it the, is her. Yes. And she is the goth chick on NCIS. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which by the way, when that, when you talk about somebody who was hot for her age, she was 50 when she was filming NCIS and she looked like she was 20 years old. Uh, Paula, uh, Pret, Pretty. Yes. Which she, um, she, so. she, I don't know. Like, and she was playing a college student? In this film, she was, yes. How old was she in, when, this in the movie? <sighs> old. She, she had to be like in her 40s almost. Yeah, I want to say that she, she was in her 40s when she filmed that. Mm -hmm. I mean. I'm a college student. Born. Oh, no, she looked she, like it, though. By far, she, she was. Oh, go ahead. She was born in 69. So this yeah. movie came out in what? 2002 so trying to do the math here i don't yeah she's like like 40 33 uh 33 yes she was 33 she looked like she was a college student though yes. i mean you know i I guess that's the one benefit to being a goth chick. I mean, you're never out in the sun so your skin doesn't age like the rest. <laughs> of that's true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Vampire stats. Um but yeah, I mean, like you know, uh, it still boggles my mind watching this movie. I was like, okay, they, the, I mean, they picked way too pretty people for the characters that they were trying. I mean, you know, trying to you know work with in this film. Um, it's it's, it's crazy later on in the movie when you get to the one thing that I hate about this movie though is that horse subplot. Like, why did they? I mean, I know they edit for shock factor, but that right. scene when they're on the boat. 
uh, and the horse like freaks out because, you know, I guess it realizes the curse is upon, you know, Naomi Watts and it has to run away from her, uh, cause it's hinted at earlier in the film. That's why all the horses died or something with around Samara, like it runs off the boat and then it gets chopped up by the, you know, the engine at the back or whatever the, but I'm just like, is that necessary? I mean, other than the shock factor, I mean, it doesn't really add to the movie any. Yeah. I, it, <laughs> It was use. I don't know. It was kind of. It was a little useless in my opinion. But whatever. I feel like the, I feel like this movie had uh, this movie had the goods as far as like the music. You know, Hans Zimmer yeah. knocked it out. There's a reason that Hans Zimmer went on to like be. You know, like I mean, for for this director, Gore Verbinski, he went on to do like every other film for this guy because I mean, he knocked out of the park with this movie as far as the atmosphere and the you know and the the horror you know elements the quick shots of the rictus grin and all that work but i feel like they just they they had too much bloat to the script like they didn't know when to say okay we need to cut this this there's no reason to add this extra scene you know yeah maybe um did you already bring up already to the blue filter i have not brought up the blue green filter i was going to get to that this (sighs) is the movie that really started that trend like big time oh my god There's a reason why they used it. I'll get into the trivia, but basically the gist of it is, is they wanted to have this like almost like diseased, you know, like pale, like, you know, Victorian era. No, it's almost like a bloated corpse, like look, you know, like the green and the blue or like, you know, somebody who's been in a well for a while or something you know, they were trying to tie it in thematically. Okay. That makes sense for Samara, but for everyone else. They they wanted the whole film to have like that diseased, cursed, okay. you know, look, feel about it. Is what the, what the reasoning was. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I think that it was excessive. I mean, going back and watching Ringu, that was one thing I liked about it because it was natural. Like yeah. the colors were, you know, there was dark when they needed to be. It was like natural lighting. They didn't like, you know, it was like this version of was it Oregon? Was it Seattle or Oregon? I can't remember where they, this was set at. It was like one of the two. Um, but anyways, like they, it was like the whole place just, you know, had like this, you know, you know, pale, like, you know, or just like, I mean, it was overcast constantly. Like there was no natural anything to it. Like the whole film just looked kind of gross because of it. Yeah. I, I actually like the blue filter they put on it. For the entire film? Yeah. Cause it plays in the area where they were. Like the yeah, whole. They were, they were in Seattle, Washington. It gave the illusion of overcast the whole time. I mean, and I I know for the grudge that made sense in Japan because that's is how Japan looks, but they got a little excessive with it in the early two thousands. It was applied to about every film. Like yeah. they, if they couldn't copy the the lanky, you know, dark haired pale ghost or whatever, they they copied this, you know, for whatever reason. So, um, now. Kind of, I mean, that's we talked about that cinematography wise. I mean, how, how do you feel about you know that part of it, like how it was filmed and like the shots and, and all that? Um, I think it looked really good. I think, I, I think everything looked good in this film, aside from the filter. I don't have any complaints. Lighting was good, uh, the angles were good, uh, the clarity was good. I, 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 I don't think I think the short film was better because the short film was creepier to me in this film the way that they did it like those random scenes of people looked like they were having seizures or dying or what you know like just all the stuff they added in there you know see I di- I didn't um, see the short film yeah I didn't either it, well, and that I mean, was the Rings film, right the, I'm talking about the film that Samara played oh. you know, is like her video like you know oh, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, scenes yeah. in that are creepier okay. than they yes. are in the original film oh um. In terms of that, I thought you were talking about overall just the film, but the actual the actual film film, like the one that they're watching. I'm talking about all of it, but I'm just throwing it out there as something I liked. I thought that that, you know, like the, the scenes that they rolled into the, you know, Samara's video yeah. uh, were creepier in their, like, imagery. Oh, like they don't, 100%. The bad part is they don't really connect like they do to the story in the original movie. Yeah, the Japanese one. The original it, movie has a purpose. Yes. You know. Whereas this one are just creepy scenes. This is just like, reason. oh my God, I saw this horrible film and now I'm going to fucking die, you know? It's like somebody back then, because this was around the same time, went to rotten.com, which, you know, that's a dated reference for anybody in the U.S., but it was just the website you go to to see the most horrible things like autopsies and that kind of shit. Uh, basically, snuff films on the internet at the time. 
and like somebody went to that and he's like oh shit we've got to add this in there you oh know, yeah this is some weird fucking you know shit that we can throw the, in yeah the they scene. just made it weird i <laughs> thought it was effective though because i had not seen obviously the japanese one and so when you see this you're like what the fuck you're literally just like what the fuck is this shit this is weird you know and then the fact that you know, well, now you're going to fucking die and you're dealing with some other supernatural bullshit. I thought it was effective, but having the, seen... The, I was going to say the scene with the fly is really effective where she, like, yeah. bends the tape and then the fly is there and she picks it out. Like, you know, it's it's a good foreboding nod to the fact that shit can come out of the video. Yeah. You know? Oh, no, no, no. That was hella cool. Um, But having watched the Japanese one and seeing how every, like scene had had a purpose i was like okay i I liked that i'm not even gonna pretend that i I, didn't i I did like that better story-wise yeah uh, the japanese because there you know there's the the letters that you see at one point say eruption and that's because shizuko predicted there was going to be an eruption on that island and you know in this one there's not really much anything other just weird shit going on in the video yeah um it, it was clear for the most part. I mean, you know, as far as the rest of the movie, other than that weird filter that they had to add to everything, I, I, I wish that they would have lightened it up a little bit. I don't mind it being there to make it overcast, but I feel like it was too blue and too green at times. I think it made sense when they were on the island where all the horses were and she was getting closer to what Samara, where Samara yeah, was and everything. That made sense. Getting closer to the curse, so it was more decayed. That, yeah, yeah, I agree with everything you. Everything else, it wasn't necessary, but I yeah, I don't know. Maybe they wanted the whole tone of the film to have that kind of effect, you know? I really like what they did, you know, speaking this ties in the cinematography in a roundabout way, the all the video editing stuff, like with him and, you know, like, I mean, the way that they, the videos, like they, they manipulated them and like they were able to bend the image on the tape or whatever so they could see the lighthouse off to the edge. And, you know, I, I like how they manipulated all that stuff on screen. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um. Story we've kind of mentioned a little bit. Did you have anything else to add to the cinematography, Noah, before we move on? No, I just liked it better. I thought that it, it, it was just an execution across the board in every single aspect of what you're looking for in a horror movie. It, it was way more effective as far as the scares, I give you that. Um, story, uh, this suffers on the story. This got too much bloat and it don't really, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in it that don't really have a purpose in my opinion. I, I like the investigative part of it better, but I feel like they were a little, I don't know the, the setting, like I've mentioned before, setting that well, like far away from where the cabin was at was extraneous. I mean, I get why they did it. They wanted it to be like under that tree, which we'll get into that actually has symbolism and it's actually cool. But I feel like they could have did that tree near that cabin and, and made it work that way if they would have just kept the, the, the script a little bit tighter that way. Um, I don't know what your all's thoughts on that. I'm not I'm not quite sure what tree you're talking about. The There was a tree where the well was at, and it's actually called a Samara tree. It's the one that's got the burning leaves or whatever, you know, that, that they see outside. When, she's, when Naomi Watts is, like, looking at the end of the film – uh, near, you know, outside of the, you know, the, when they're near the well and their times, you know, down yeah. the wire because they're seeing the sun setting. It's that tree she sees in the distance or whatever because that's where that was Samara's favorite tree or something. As I think in the movies, like I or something. completely forgot about that and I didn't even notice it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. So it doesn't. If it didn't have any effect on you, then it obviously didn't work as far Ye- as the story. Well, aspect. that's just me. I I'm, <laughs> I miss a lot of things in film. So, huh? Okay. <laughs> Um, acting, I, I felt like everybody but the kid did it. I mean, Brian Cox is always great. You know, like he, he's, a you know, acted for years. I mean, like we said, you know, watched Autopsy Jane Doe. He acts his ass off in that movie. That's, that's great. Uh, Naomi Watts is great at what she's doing in this. I felt like the actor for Noah was, eh, he was just there. Yeah. I mean, he, he wasn't bad, but he just wasn't really a standout or anything. Um, I don't really feel like he sold sold as much of the tension and the like, you know, desire to like find the cure as much as Naomi Watts did. Well, he was also like very she... skeptical too. Well, yeah, there is that. I mean, and um, barely any links to this kid at all, which is for both films was just <laughs> fucking weird. Like the parents really are weird. hella good friends, but like the dad's not in the picture of the <clears throat> kid. I don't. I ne- I, I did not I could not make that work in my yeah, head. Yeah, but it was just like the Japanese one. No, I know it was, but 
it, it, doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't that make somebody sense. Would be that disassociated with their son. I mean, even in like you would. I mean, even like Japanese culture, that that's the lineage, right? I mean, they would still have that that mentality. It's like that is my, you know, that's my child. That's my lineage, especially yeah. it being a male. You know, passing down the, you know, it's the, your heir. You know, I I, I completely know, get weird. them not being married. Like m- relationships don't work out, and you could still be you could still be you know mutual afterwards. It's the whole there's a kid involved and the dad just kind of looks at this kid like this weird alien being in both films. Yeah, and that, it's, that scene where he just like meets him at the corner as the kid's going to school by yeah. himself, you know, and, and it's just, just they look at each other and it's like, you know, there's not even really any acknowledgement. It's like, all right, random strange child that I know is my son. Yeah. Move, you know, like leave me. <laughs> Be gone with you. It, I don't know. I mean, that maybe, whole thing was weird. Maybe he was pissed off because the kid didn't really, you know, like he didn't, he felt like the kid was too ugly to be his. And, you know, she quite possibly maybe got knocked up and or got knocked up by another guy, you know, like that's why know. he divorced her. Cause they had an ugly kid. <laughs> what if he was that shallow? I mean, yeah. think about it. it's like, you know, this kid's fucking ugly, right? I'm gone. I'm, I'm bailing on you. It's like, you know, as hot as you were, I thought we was going to have, you know, pretty kids together, but you know, obviously there's something wrong with your, you know, placenta. So I'm going to get the your fuck placenta. out of here. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, possible. I can see him doing that. Um, I'm just going to go, uh, I'm going to go fuck some hot goth chicks in my, in one of my classes. And I'm, yeah. I'm going to leave you. Yeah. I'm hot. I'm going to bang some young college girls. <laughs> <laughs> and then proceeds to bang girls less hot than Naomi Watts. Yeah, it's like they're not going to be as pretty as you because nobody is. But you know, I, I, maybe I'll the kid will look myself. better because of that reason. I'll console myself with all the times I got my dick wet. So I'm just going to see you. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, uh, the music I've already mentioned. I think Hans Zimmer did a pretty good job. With this oh film yeah, as far as like the sweeping music, it you know, especially toward the end where the the time's counting down. It's like you can, you know, the music's adding the tension because it's got, you know, it's just that, like, it's almost a storm is building. Like, is yeah. the way he, you know, built the the music at that part. It's um, fucking Hans Zimmer. And it, and it's got those sharp, you know, like notes or whatever. Yeah, with this grin and all that that you need to really like amp the tension. You know, like pop. You know, what when you need to. So it it suffices. Um. Anything else you want to discuss about the movie before we move on to trivia? I think we kind of covered it. I mean, there, if there's I think we got else, the gist of it. it we got the lore. We got the story. We got the weird father son relationship. We got the ugly child, the hot parents. I think we went through it. Yeah, I, I don't. I can't think of anything that we're really missing. I mean, I will throw this in there. That's pretty brutal. How Brian Cox killed himself. I mean, dude, like, just throw some, throw a bunch of pills down your neck and go out that way. Do you really have to like hook up every fucking thing in the house to a generator and like you know go that way? I mean, damn. Yeah, I mean, I get the 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 whole dying in the water because she hates water. I mean, they point that out right after he dies. She's looking at a photo that her kid drew, and he you could hear him saying, "Well, she hates the water." But holy shit, okay. it was overkill. It was way overkill. Like, he had ever plug it. I mean, it looked like one of those. It looks like uh, uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation yeah. where Griswold has got the, you know, the lights hooked up. And he's got all the plug-ins, you know. It's like, really, dude? I stand by Is Clark it? W. Griswold still had way more plugged in. <laughs> Oh, if we only known he was that close to committing suicide. I, I knew that movie was dark, but I mean, I didn't realize it was that dark. It I had mean, dark undertones. I... <laughs> um, but moving on to trivia, uh, there's some good trivia for this film, actually. The film was originally promoted under the title Ring, like Ringu, the original Japanese film. But uh, shortly before its uh, title, the uh, re- shortly before its release, it was titled To The Ring. Um Although the meaning of the title, The Ring, is ambiguous, uh, Koji Suzuki, you know, said it was more to mean the cyclical nature of the plot rather than the phone ringing or the constant uh, or the circular images in the American remake. Uh, To promote this film, the studio placed copies. This is the good stuff. Uh, They placed copies of the mysterious killer tape at concerts and events prior to the film opening. Uh, The table, the tape had a label directing whoever watched it to visit a website. Uh, www.anopenletter.com supposedly written by a pedophile who had seen the tape and was now trying to warn others about his impending fate. This was a character portrayed by Chris Cooper in a subplot that was deleted from the theatrical release. 
in the theatrical release at the end of the film when Naomi Watts makes the copy, she takes the cop to save her son. She takes the copy to this pedophile that she's been like following to, to fucking kill him. Cause who gives a shit if he dies, you know? And uh, that's a good way to save a kid by getting rid of a, p- a pedo at the same time. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm curious why they cut that from the movie. Uh, I, I don't know if I've got that in here. If it even says, uh, let's see. I think it comes up here in a second about his involvement. Uh, the website contained links that led to other m- movie-related mock-ups, including a page written by one of Katie's friends who was unaware of Katie's death and believed she'd been kidnapped or run away, and a page written by a scientist who researched psychic phenomena involving television transmissions. Uh, when the movie was released, DreamWorks deleted all of the web pages and denied ever having anything to do with them. So wow. Uh, that's uh but that's good marketing that's what the uh the Blair Witch Project did because I remember that I had a buddy who was like man there's this movie that's based on a real life thing and it's got a website and everything you need to go to it I remember this you know vividly and I went to the website and I was all freaked out I was like this is gonna be the best thing ever and when I watched the movie I was like what the fuck did I just oh what you didn't like the movie I did not like the, I, I was too hyped for the Blair Witch Project. I'd walked to that movie thinking it was the worst piece of shit I'd seen in years. Like I, I did, I mean, the story they built up on that website was so much better oh, than what they showed you in that had, movie. Okay. So you had like too much <laughs> stimulation before you actually went and watched it. Yeah. Cause I was like, man, this movie's fucking haunted. Like it's real, I, you know, like I didn't have any of know, that. I remember when I watched it, I, it was out on VHS. I, I knew about it and I and I wanted to see it and I ended up watching it on a Halloween night by myself in my in uh I was staying on on a couch in my mom's garage. I was visiting. Oh, that'd from, be a good way to watch it. That'd yeah, really so it was Halloween it. night. I was by myself. I was in the garage where I was sleeping on a couch. That's where I was living in between going to my between my mom's and dad's house. And I remember watching it by myself on Halloween night. It it to me it was hella scary. I was like, Holy shit, dude. Little did he know that just years later on Halloween night, he would be marrying a Latina for the worst <laughs> horrors of his life. And living the Blair Witch Project. Hey! Every day of his life. Um, no, I watched it in a packed movie theater. Like, it was the most hyped movie of uh, that time period. And, like, that theater was, like, there was people standing in the aisles, I feel like, at the back. Like, it was that packed. Damn. And, like, everybody walking out was just like, what? It, was that was that how it ended? Like what? What did I just what, what happened? You know? Yeah. Like, it was a you know. It's, that, it's a good movie to watch in a small setting. Yeah. Like, if you just have a yeah, couple a lot people better in a small setting. Yeah. Okay, so I watched it with one of my friends, and I w- it's weird because we watched it right when it came out, and I don't remember the theater being packed, but we were also the type to go to like a midnight showing, you know, where you you know you're gonna just get the weirdos that go at that time. It's not gonna be a lot of people, but then. Yeah. It scared me so bad. And this is just, I mean, Latinas were always going to believe in this shit anyways. So I took my mom to fucking watch it. And this was when I had I had actually talked to Noah not too long ago, like a day or two ago, about how my parents like never let me dress gothy growing up. So I was now, quotation mark, an adult at this point. Uh, I was like 18, 19 or something. And I take her to the theater and I am wearing this black dress and my nails are painted black. My nails were just naturally long. So my mom was so fucking scared after watching it. She made me sleep in the bed with her and she woke up screaming because I'm laying next to her. Yes. And my, my nails are just over my back and I'm like, (laughs) she's freaking out. She thinks there's a witch in bed with her. So, you know. This is an unpopular opinion, but I, I like the sequel better than the original. I have and not I know, seen the sequel. Uh, the sequel's the pretty book good. Of, uh, the Book of Secrets, I know a lot of people hate it, but I actually enjoy it. Yeah, uh, that quite one. A bit. The third one's pretty good, too. Uh, I do. Oh, is that the 20? Is that the remake? The 2016 remake? It's not really a remake, it's a continuation it's a, off the first one. It's a continuation. One. Yeah, I thought that one was pretty good, actually. Yeah, I watched I, it. In actually, theater. I just watched that last night. I do know that there is a porn parody. Um, you want to so, watch well, it? The, it wouldn't surprise me because if you watch Blair Witch Book of Secrets 2, there are two very hot women in that movie. One of them's a goth girl, and yes. then one of them's like, you know, like, uh, I, I think, like, kind of like a redhead, you know, character. And like, they're like very bisexual in scenes and like doing, because uh, part of the movie is they're all going crazy. Isn't one uh, of them pregnant? You know? I thought one of the girls uh, was pregnant. 
Uh, there's th- there's a third one. She's a preg- yeah uh, a pregnant like woman in a relationship, and then there's the two there's the two younger girls, and like the two younger girls are like there's like a scene like a weird scene where they're like having a three way with this guy, and like uh, they're all, but they're all killing each other at the same time because they're all going psychotic from what they're the the, the Blair Witch or whatever. Um, very uh, it's it's a lot of cut scene quick cuts too it's like you see them there for a second they think they're like getting it on and then when it shows the what reality is actually happening they're sitting there like slicing each other's throats and shit oh fun uh in any of the movies do you guys ever get to actually see the Blair Witch I think you see it in the new one yeah kind of kind of they they did like I remember Todd McFarlane for his movie Maniac series made like a mock up of what he thought the Blair Witch looked like. It was pretty creepy. It was like a tree creature, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything. That's what I always kind of assume, too. So, okay. Um, getting back to this film after that big, long, tire, you know, uh, tangent. Uh, Chris Cooper, in an interview, he was the one that played the pedophile, told Sci Fi Wire, it was what they call a bookend. I opened the movie and closed the movie. It was two scenes, and I was a serial rapist or a murderer who deserved everything that was coming to me. Uh, because uh, Naomi Watts' character was a journalist, I was trying to convince her that I had found God and I had straightened my ways and rehabilitated myself. I was looking for an out, and she didn't buy it correctly. So then in the tail end, she pays me a visit and gives me the tape. What I hear is when they, they ran the screenings, it was more dis- the, a disruption than anything. They said, well, where's Cooper? Uh, we want to see more. Uh, we want to see more of him, so they cut it all. Uh, uh, so basically they were saying that they didn't understand why this character was only in the film at the beginning and the end. So the test audience is what got it cut. Um, the, but they said, you can still see his face briefly in the film on the front page of a newspaper in Noah's loft. So they left that in there. Okay. Um, Long before the movie premiered, the killer video was used as a commercial. The commercial did not mention any movie for nearly a month, so they basically played Samara's video oh, as, the, as the commercial for the film without even giving a hint what it was about. That has to... That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> I can only imagine. Like, you have no fucking idea. You're just watching a fucking serial... Or, excuse me, a commercial about toilet paper, and then this fucking <laughs> weird-ass... <laughs> Movie All premiere commercial images, comes on. Some yeah. Creepy ass girls crawling out of a whale. Like, what the fuck am I seeing? You're like, okay. <laughs> Did, was there anything, though, like something that said coming soon or anything that indicated it's, it's watch out for this, it's coming, you know? I don't know. It doesn't specify, unfortunately. So I don't know if it had any of that to signify that it was for a movie shit. or anything. Uh, on its first week of release in the U.S. and Canada, select cinemas put actual copies of the cursed tape on seats for unsuspecting viewers as freebies. That would have been pretty cool. Yeah. Could you imagine? Oh, my God. Just walk in the theater and there's a seat waiting, or, you know, your seat's waiting with like a blank, or, you know, a VHS tape sitting there and it's, you know, it's Samara's video on it. Yeah. Um, the cursed video is now available as an Easter egg feature on the DVD. Uh, select, look here, and press down, and your cursor will disappear. Press enter, and this has an interesting feature. Your remote control is disabled. Uh, once the video started playing, you can't stop it, pause it, fast forward it, or return the menu. Unless you turn off the TV, you're forced to watch the whole thing. Uh-uh. Uh, when it's when it's over, the DVD returns to the menu. Then you hear a phone ring twice before you're given control over your remote control. Oh, that's awesome. That's that's cool. Um, an interesting feature on the VHS release is that if you rewind the tape to the very beginning or just uh, put the tape in the VCR when fully rewound, when you play it, you see the cursed video. After the segment ends, you hear a phone ringing twice, and then it goes into the previews. Also, after the movie is ended, you see additional scenes that help explain the mystery of the cursed video. Uh, but in the VHS reissue, it was just the movie itself. So if you got the initial release of this, it actually had all that built into it. Oh, man. That's pretty cool, too. Yeah. Um, now, here's the stuff about the tree. The tree with the fiery red leaves featured in the movie is a Japanese maple, the, which is, you know, hitting back to its Japanese origins. The fruit of this tree is known as uh, Samara. Uh, the red Japanese maple seen in the video was artificial, built out of steel tubing and plaster with painted silk for the leaves. The crew dubbed it Lucille after a certain red-headed actress. Uh-uh. Uh, w- when filming in Washington State, the tree was erected three times only to have it knocked out by nearly 100 mile an hour wind gust. In Los Angeles, it was erected for a fourth time only to be blown over again, this time by 60 mile an hour wind. So it sounds like God did not like this tree. Oh. No. <laughs> 
the massive success of the sixth sense, which I just realized whenever I made up the things for this, that we're probably going to have to cover this this season because obviously, oh, yeah. you know, uh, was what gave Paramount Pictures the confidence to greenlight a remake of Ringu uh, due to the rise in popularity of supernatural mysteries and thrillers. Uh, now, Sixth Sense was one that, I mean, that was a big one for me. That movie got me good. Like, I mean, when I when the twist hit on that one, I was oh, just yeah. chills down my spine. You're like, what the fuck? Um, the only good movie, the, well, I take that back. Unbreakable is really good, too. But the, one of the few good movies by Shyamalama Ding Dong. <laughs> uh, DreamWorks took an unusual but effective tack on the, the release of this plan for this film when the lengthy post-production and test screening process was complete it took more time than usual largely because of edits to make the film less graphically violent and moved away from a potential r rating to pg-13 uh the company decided to launch it in a f- in fewer theaters than expected the logic was simple if the film did well during the october 18th through 20th 2002 weekend it would be expanded to great anticipation just ahead of halloween uh, the ring ended up improving the box office in weekend two and became one of the biggest surprise hits of the year. So they slow rolled this one when nice. it came out. Um, <clears throat> until Stephen King's It 2017, this movie was the highest grossing horror remake in history with a total worldwide gross of over uh, $249 million. The Grudge held the title for the highest grossing first weekend by comparison. Uh, so both films like really uh, knocked it out of the park for remakes. Uh, sold more. It sold more than two million DVD copies in the U.S. alone in its first 24 hours Damn. of release. That's fucking insane. Uh, for the choice of the film's color, here you go. It was decided that everything was to be tinged with the color green to give the film a sickly, unnatural feeling. Uh, sets were also lit in a way that none of the characters have a shadow to create an almost subconscious sense of creepiness. I didn't realize that about Wow, the film, that's so. pretty... I've never really noticed a person's shadow in a film anyway, so now that's crazy. Um, producer Neil Edelstein offered the remake to David Lynch to direct, but he turned it down, which that would have been an interesting take. David Lynch has some wild stuff. You know, he was the Twin Peaks guy and... And, you know, directed uh, several things, uh, Blue Velvet and several others. Uh, Gore Verbinski deliberately chose not to cast major stars, which Naomi Watts was not a big star at this time, uh, as any of the main or supporting characters as he wanted the film to be discovered by audiences. Uh, Naomi Watts, Martin Henderson, and Amber Tamblin would receive retroactive uh, recognition for this film. Wow. So it was kind of their big breaks. Yeah, uh, I didn't realize that either. Um, the first collaboration between director Gord Verbinski and composer Hans Zimmer ever since then Zimmer has composed the music for every Verbinski directed film, except a cure for wellness that came out in 2016. So he just was blown out of the, the water by Zimmer's, uh, you know, music in this. And uh, ever since then, he's the go-to guy for him. Damn. I, uh, that's of, a hell of a good movie too. A cure for wellness. I've, I've, I, th- I think I've seen that one. That's the one where they basically drive them insane, right? I mean, if well, I remember right. Kind of drive them insane, but they, they pump them full of bad stuff at the end. Okay. I can't, uh, not really sure about the ending on that one. I'll have to go back and rewatch it. It's been a while since I've seen it. Now, it, here's some interesting trivia about the, the, the characters in the movie. The role of Rachel was first offered to Jennifer Conley, who would later star in the Japanese horror remake, uh, another Japanese horror remake, Dark, Dark horror. Water, in 2005. She was also the, the girl in, uh, you know, Legend, and um, well, yeah. not in Legend, but in Labyrinth. I mean, if you remember that movie. So, I mean, you know, most people remember David Bowie's cod piece in that film more than anything oh else. Oh, my God. That is, there's a whole fucking article on that right now. <laughs> it's for some reason blowing up right now and i'm like oh my god um i love that movie though it's great i mean yeah. very dark movie for kids oh I yeah mean, for the time uh the script was then offered to jennifer love huge tits uh then to gwyneth paltrow then to kate beckinsale and then finally to naomi watts uh, Jennifer Love Huge Tits turned it down, not be- wishing to be typecast as a screen queen because she just got uh, through doing, I believe it was, uh, um, I know what you did last summer. So she didn't want to, she didn't want to be stuck in that role. So she passed it on. That worked out for her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, 
I wonder if she's beating herself up for it now. I mean, she was literally on a show, and it, granted, it wasn't a horror show by any means, but she was on a supernatural show for like how many years? That show was so bad. Ghost Whisperer, you mm-hmm. shut your filthy whore mouth. The go- well, have you seen that movie? Like a ghost Whisperer yeah. or something, right? No, that's what it was called. Ghost Whisperer, wasn't it? Was it was horrible. It was so bad. <laughs> that was such a good show. I still wish I could no, watch it now. It was so fucking bad. Loved that show. Um, I just love Jennifer Love Huge Tits, I think, is what it comes down to. Like, I, her, all her shows are horrible, but for some reason, I love them yeah, all. If they probably put in her bikini, a lot of guys would watch. Yeah, well, I'm not a guy. I'm not staring at her tits. My okay. favorite film with her will always be uh, Can't Hardly Wait. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, I love that, that teen rom com. Yeah. Just something about that movie is just that perfect. A really good soundtrack, too. Um, Brian Cox was the only actor considered to play Richard Morgan. He turned down a part in Ghost Ship, the 2002 movie, <laughs> to film this one. I guess that was a good, a good move. Because we, we all know that Ghost Ship only has five good minutes of, of, of anything, and then after that, it's kind of a shit movie. What do you think of Ghost Ship, babe? Sucked. Okay. <laughs> that first scene where the, the rigging is killing everybody is pretty cool. Though. Yeah, that's probably one of the best like kill scenes. I Yeah, but then it goes way fast. Oh, yeah, it goes downhill quick. Um, DeVay Chase took the role of Samara after losing the role of Sarah Altman in Panic Room to Kristen Stewart. Oh, shit. (laughs) Oh. uh, Panic Room's the big breakout for Dwight Yoakam, right? If I remember right. I don't remember. I I thought I had Jodie Foster in it. But I was thinking Dwight Yoakam was one of the gangsters in that film, which was really funny because he had, like, corn rolls and all that stuff. And no, like, you shut know, up. No, he didn't. I'm pretty yeah, sure Yeah, I did. think he did. Oh, my God. Hold on one second. I am Googling this shit right now. You guys can um, continue I don't talking. know if he did that or if he did Sling Blade first. It was one of the two was what led him into this film career. What the? Oh, Dwight Yoakam, there he goes right there. No, yeah. he didn't have cornrows. Okay. Panic Room wasn't too bad. Um, it was it wasn't a terrible movie. I mean, it was good for what it was supposed to be, like home invasion f- movie. Okay. Uh, Amber Tamblin would go to uh, would go on to reappear in another Japanese horror remake, The Grudge Two. Uh, excluding the cast of Sadako versus Kayako, she was one of the few actors to appear in a ring film and a Juwan film. Uh, in both the American and Japanese versions, the name of the little girl is connected to a story about death. The name Samara refers to a story told by W. Somerset uh, Mom as uh, or Mayum as an appointment in Samara about a, gir- a man who meets death in the marketplace and flees to the town of Samara. So they're kind of, that's kind of another reason they took that name. Um, <clears throat> Seattle, Washington was chosen as the chief location of the film production because of its wet, isolated setting, and it does kind of match the Japanese setting quite a bit, so yeah. it works. Uh, the Moesco Island Lighthouse is a fictional name for a real lighthouse located in, located in Newport, Oregon. That's where I was thinking of Oregon from. Yeah. Uh, built in 1873, the real lighthouse is named Yakina Head Lighthouse and is still currently an active aid to navigation. It is reputed to be haunted by the ghost of a past keeper, which Ooh. I feel like that's every lighthouse. Oh, yeah, every know. lighthouse ever made. <laughs> <clears throat> there are no title cards or opening credits to the movie, although there is a flash of the ring during the DreamWorks logo, which is cool. Um, subtle images of circles in various forms, such as the designs on the doctor's sweater, the shower drain, and Rachel's apartment number appear throughout the movie. Hmm. So they're always working in the circle design through the whole film. Okay. Um, Production designer Tom uh, Dufield relied on Andrew Weiss painting as his main visual inspiration for the film. And I looked this guy's, you know, Andrew Weiss paintings up, which if you want, you can look them up right now. They're pretty weird. Like, I get why he he relied on them as visual because they're like these strange, like, landscape paintings that seem, like, very barren. Like, they'll show, like, you know, just, like, clothes on a, like, a you know, a, a clothesline or something. It's just out in the middle of nowhere, and there's nobody around. And it's, like, the way it's drawn, it's almost like the scary stories they tell in the dark but not like that, you know, black and white look. They're like painted, but they've got that weird, like surreal look to them. Like they're, they're really weird. Um, Oh yeah. uh, When Rachel, they they got like, they just got a weird, creepy vibe to them. They do. They Scary stories to tell in the dark. That is the best, like the illustrations from those is the best way to describe this. Cause I'm looking at one right now. It's a naked lady laying on a bed. 
It looks like the basement from the movie we just watched, The Black Mound. <laughs> and yeah, it's creepy. It's got a lot of that weird black splatter look to it. That could be paint, could be blood. It's yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, I definitely get where the guy, you know, was inspired by that. I was like, okay, that is pretty creepy looking. Uh, when Rachel is looking off her balcony at the units of other residents, she focuses on one apartment containing a seated man with his left leg in a cast. This recalls Hitchcock's rear window, 1954, in which James Stewart with his left leg in a cast peers into his neighbor's apartments. Mm. Uh, furthermore, the man is watching a race. Uh, James Stewart's character in rear window broke his leg while photographing a race. Oh, wow. So that's kind of cool. That is a very good movie, by the way. I went back and rewatched that. That stands the test of time. Even though there's been a ton of movies that's done, and that's, you know, Disturbia, I believe, with Shia LaBeouf was the same kind of movie. Um, there's been several, uh, the new uh, um, Fright, Fright Night remake or whatever. It's kind of got the same vibes where, you know, uh, Yelchin is kind of like watching out the window. But I like that, say, but James Stewart's version, it still holds up. I want to say one John one of John Carpenter's first movies was something like that. I'm trying to think of the name of there it. There is there's 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 it's a, it's a woman in an apartment. It's like she's a, something about a phone call or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I'm trying yeah. to think of the name of it. It was one of the first movies that John Carpenter that kind of got him on the map. When a stranger calls, is that like um, or is it like the original version of that? I no, believe it's, it's the name it's of it. It's something right? different. Oh, Raina has a phone in front of her. What? What are we looking at? John Carpenter movie list. I want to say it's from like late sixties, maybe mid. Oh wait a minute! I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's. Uh, I was actually thought about buying this movie. It's. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's almost like that movie that you're talking about. It's almost like a giallo. It's like he he kind of went like the you know Dario Argento route, and it's like he this woman's like getting a it, it, she's she saw somebody get killed, and now she's being like yes. pursued by the killer. It's like one of those type movies. Yeah, correct. I'm trying to think of the name um, of it though. It's like the woman on floor something or floor something. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Anything. Someone's watching me. What year? 1978. Might have been it. Show me a, let me see the picture of it. Hold on. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because it says it's a television film of a single working woman who soon yeah, after arriving it. in L.A. discovers she's being stalked. Yeah, I, I, I thought the name was something different, but that's it. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Is this the, there's this Eyes of Law or Mars that I think might be the one you're thinking of, actually. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's that's the Giallo one I was talking about. I don't know if it's the same thing. She's a fashion photographer that specializes in stylized violence. In the middle of a controversy of whether photographs glorify violence and degrading the women, Laura begins seeing in first person to the eyes of the killer, real time visions of the murders of her friends and colleagues. And what year was that? 1978. Yeah, it was somewhere around that time, but yeah. It was one of those two movies. It has yeah, to be. I know he took a chance making that of. movie and it, it, it paid off for him. Um, and then he went on to do Halloween, obviously, and that blew up big time. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> they went into production, uh, without a completed script. Uh, Aaron Kruger had done three drafts when Scott Frank was brought in to do another uncredited rewrite. So that's what I'm talking about with some of the stuff in the film. I literally think like they, they went in this movie and they got to the point where they were filming and it's like, you know, they had that line. It's like, is he a professor? Is he a video editor? Oh, yeah. Like, he's both, you know, like, I mean, because they have the, the script done when they started it. <clears throat> when Noah and Rachel return to the inn at the end of the movie, there's a sign that reads closed until further notice under the Shelter Mountain Inn sign. In an earlier cut of the film, the cabin manager dies from watching the tape. Oh, shit. Uh, and probably that's the reason for the inn being closed. So that's kind of a neat little thing that they Yeah, cut out I didn't even catch that. Yeah, I'm curious why they cut that from the movie. Well, they said the original cut of the film was over 130 minutes long with oh, an yeah. estimated 20 minutes of footage excised from the final cut. So as bloated as I feel like the story is, they, they, they did cut it down quite a bit from what it was going to be, at least. Did they ever release a full unedited? I think they've got like some of the alternate versions out there, but I don't think they ever came out with like a full uh, director's cut or anything like that of it. 
Um, now, this is cool. Playing the movie frame by frame in the exact moment when Katie Embry is scared to death at the beginning of the movie, you can see all the images that appear on the video. Each image appears for just a fraction of a second. Oh, yeah. The effect is repeated at the end of the movie. Yes, when it shows Noah's uh, face. Um, and also, there's this, it get, this is something I really like about the movie. I mean, despite my criticism of it, like when it gets toward the end of the movie, the image of the ring is flashing on the screen in between like cuts for the audience to see. It's almost like you're getting cursed by the ring yeah. is the way they build it up in the movie. Like right after the horse scene, when it cuts from that to the island, you know, afterward, like after they get off the boat, like right in between there is a big flash of it and it gets more pronounced as the movie goes on. I barely noticed that. That's insane. It's it's pretty cool. Like I, when I saw it, I was like, okay, I like that they did this, you know, to kind of symbolize the movie you're watching is actually cursed. They definitely had a lot of scare effects in the movie, for sure. Um, self editing some of these uh, ratings. I've got I can here see that. <laughs> I'm it. watching it in real time, ladies and gentlemen. You know, if uh, you want to know the real ratings, La Urena has the tea. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm going to change this one too. Cause I, I don't agree with it. I just, I made these up and I was just like, I've been thinking about it and I just, I mean, I was so burnt out. Like I was trying to come up with like ratings for these things. So, so I'll let you all go on the Ringu part first, since I've watched all these, unfortunately. So I've, I've got way more to rate. Um, okay. I'll start. I'm going to give Ringu a three because it wasn't scary but it was a good thriller and it had some good lore behind it and it really kind of followed through with a lot of the things specifically the video that was being watched like it related to everything that they had to do to kind of solve this I don't know mystery if you will um yeah and again was kind of the start to something what would end up being the American version which is Pretty fucking scary, so um, I want to give it, right in the middle, I want to give it, you know, at least some credit, because, like I said, I was bored, though. Um, that's why it's not rated higher. I kind of lost interest, and I was fucking over it, and it was a kind of a slow burn. So, uh, it's just going to be right in the middle for me. What about Noah? It gets a three. It's not a horror movie, it's a thriller. Is well, the, the the plot idea is good. It just wasn't executed, in my opinion. All, all the psychic stuff, kind of, that's... Something about doing that throws it off for me. It's like you're... you're instead of actually doing the heavy lifting with the storytelling, you're just trying to stretch it out in certain areas. I don't, I don't know. I didn't like that. It, okay. it's, it's a way, it's a way to, for you to cover grounds with plot holes. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, there was ways they could have brought it out without having to rely so heavily upon that. I would have been fine if they would have just made Ra- Raoji like the psychic. That's you know? fine. Then I'll, yeah. I would accept that. But when everybody starts becoming a psychic, <laughs> then you're 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 not doing the heavy lifting of telling the story. You're just making all these big jumps. And speaking of that, something that I just remembered that I didn't bring up, uh, of what I was going to mention, why some woke people might not like it, but they got to realize it's a different culture and a different time. There are a lot of scenes where Ryoji is like basically barking orders at Raiko and like basically telling her, you've got to do this, you got to do that. I mean, he doesn't like come out and slap her or anything, but like he is very commanding. Like he he is the one leading everything in the movie. Oh my like, God, I he mean, does slap the shit out of her one time in the film, in the film though, and I was <laughs> laughing. I was like, holy shit. He slapped the fuck out of her. Um. <clears throat> But yeah, he's he's very domineering in the movie. It's like you watch the American version, and you know, uh, you know, Naomi Watts just takes you know like center stage. Like she, you know, she does what she wants to do. Like her husband barely has any effect on it whatsoever. Like you know, she just she basically tells him where to go and what to do. But like in the the Japanese version, it's very male dominated. That oh way. yeah. Uh, for me, it's a three. I mean, I everything you said. I mean, the, I love this. I love the story and how it was paced and everything about it. But the kills, the you know, just like the scares in it, they're non-existent. Like you're you're watching a thriller. You're not watching a horror movie. I mean, you know, it's. I give it credit for what it's you know the story that's there and how it was executed. But I don't like. I mean, they they if they would have punched it up, it would have knocked this movie up in like you know five stars probably. Oh yeah. <clears throat> 
So I've cover, I'll cover the, the ratings for the sequels here. I'm actually going to give Spiral as far as the convoluted and bullshit plot as it is. I actually enjoyed the weird shit in it, surprisingly. I mean, even had all that stuff about the the DNA and all that. As convoluted as it sounds, there are creepy elements to it, especially that final scene where that guy's like, you know, won't look over his shoulder because the ghost girl is behind him that's not Sadako. I actually enjoyed that movie quite a bit. So I'm going to give it like a 2.75. Like, I mean, it's not, I mean, the, the story is kind of, it's not like overly convoluted, but there is too much of the psychics. The DNA stuff is kind of weird. Like, I mean, but I, I do, but I honestly like aspects of it as far as like what it was trying to, you know, trying to do with the story, even if it got really up its own ass with all that weird shit with it. Um, Ringo two, 2.5 like you know I, and i changed that just from the three that i was given originally because now that i thought back on it just the psychic stuff everywhere just overloads that movie just way too much i mean like they're not they're not allowing a story you're you're just having all these the problem is the moment you introduce the whole thing of a psychic you can point out multiple times in the movie well if he's a psychic <laughs> how come he just didn't figure this out so you run with these inconsistencies of the of the story of the story itself that's why you they, can't do that they try to play it up differently in Ringo too, where my as a psychic, you know, the student, she's more of an empath. She like picks up feelings more than she picks up like images like, you know, Ryuji did. But at the same time, I don't know. It's still, it's too much. Like, and I was burnt out by this point. So that might be affecting it. But like, honestly, it's like, it's well executed. The acting is good, but the story is like overly complicated. And I got to give, I got to knock them down. 30 years in a goddamn well that they, that, that she <laughs> lived. There's that's laughable. I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're literally, your character has been surviving on shit water for, I mean, like there's no way that works. No, um, not at all. <clears throat> Ringo zero. I would give a three. I actually, I might bump this up to 3.5 if I wouldn't burn out of the ring. I actually yeah. think it's maybe better than the original movie in, in ways. I like the weird, Carrie being haunted by her own self aspect. It's it's neat. It's a different way to do the film. And it's also kind of cool that it's got that 60s vibe to it, even though it was set later. I mean, the way that they filmed it and the way it looks, it almost reminds me of how, even though Carrie was set in the 70s, it gives me a Carrie-like vibe and just like the, the setting of it too. Um, <clears throat> so that's those films. What what about the American version? What, what are your all's ratings on that? Mine's going to be higher. I'm going up to a four just because even though I, I when I saw this originally, I didn't know there was another storyline to it. So I'm seeing it, you know, as it's presented and it was scary. I loved the fucking what is the the style of the face? What is it called? The rictus grin. Yeah, rictus grin. That shit is fucking creepy as hell. Uh, it is. It's re it's really effective. Love the effect that it had. I was terrified of seeing it because you saw it on one character. You're like, I don't want to fucking see that again. You know. Um. I mean, <sighs> creepy, creepy kid aside, I don't know. Kind kind of useless. I I like the adventure that Naomi Watts and you know her ex husband kind of go on to kind of figure things out and everything. And I think the video that within this movie is even creepier. Well, of course it's creepier. I don't know. It's just, just one of those weird, but scary and effective movies that I think kind of holds up today. So mine's, mine's going to be a four for this one. Babe. Me. It's, it's a four and a half. It's a polished version of, of what you would expect. So you, you had the initial story. It wasn't executed where it needed to be. And then we got a hold of it on the American markets and polished it out and executed it. Yeah, there was there was there was issues with the story and the plot to a degree, but not enough where to me it felt like the entire story fell apart. So All right. four and a half. Well, I'm gonna be the outlier on this one. I, I and I I gotta explain it, but I'm giving it a two and a half. And there's a reason for that. It's not the scares. This movie is is a four or better when it comes to scares. I'm not going to argue. I mean, especially compared to the original, my issues with it. I'm a big story guy and the story is just convoluted and bloated in this one. Not to say that there's not in the original movies. It by far is with all the psychics, but I feel like they added 
too many like go here go there like they could have tightened that up i mean we talked about the script edits yeah but if they, you, hold on hold on let me pick it up let, let him finish his I, reveal I let me pick it apart a little bit look at look at the technology in that era it's not like cell phones were abundantly available and access to information and contacting people were there too you were still stuck in the time frame of the era so you had to actually put feet on the ground to a degree to figure things out I'm not disagreeing with that, but I feel like there's too many moving parts like they, they added in. I mean, they could have shortened, they could have condensed that and, and worked in the stuff that they were needing. I mean, the scenes were good that they were doing the research. I'm not throwing that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about there was a lot of like back and forth prior to that. They, the, the, like I said, the setting of the well far away from the original location, like they, that's a little extraneous that they didn't have to do, but that was like an extra place they had to go. Uh, the whole thing with the horses, especially on the boat, like that was just a shock factor that, I mean, it's, it's effective, but it didn't, it wasn't necessary for the movie. I feel like they could have focused more on like the, the, the rictus grin that they had yeah. maybe and not overused it, but they only had like really one or two good scenes of that. And I feel like that was the standout in this movie. Like oh, you yeah. know, seeing that, like, you know, really added the shock factor. Cause in same thing as in the original movie, you don't really see Samara, much until like toward the end of the movie like she's she's kind of there but like i mean you're seeing more of like the weird like you know the which is cool the fly on the video and stuff like that but like i mean you know if if you need to punch it up and you need to get some you know they need to add a few more deaths that wasn't just like horses like trying to kill themselves um a little over the top with uh brian cox's character you know the way he killed himself i mean i get what the water thing but just I don't know. There was just something about the the script seemed like it needed some fine tuning that they didn't actually do. If they would have done that, it would have brought the stories. What got me? If they would have got because the the horror elements are there, they definitely punched it up over the original tenfold, like or a hundredfold. Like it's it's way better that way. I just don't like. I mean, the story is a little just. I don't know. It's like a little bit back and forth to me, and I just feel like they they could have worked on that if they'd worked on that just a little bit and kind of not had it as bloated feeling as it was. Like it would have it would have worked a lot better. It'd been tighter, and they could have because I liked the way in the original that they tied in everything to the video, and I feel like they the creepy scenes work in this, but it would have been better if the creepy scenes had a meaning and purpose behind them too. That's another aspect that kind of didn't work. Yeah. For them. <clears throat> So, I mean, it's effective, but I just feel like there's a, there's a lot to it as far as like, you know, just the, the film itself, like it just, the, the like not all par- parts of the story were working together to, to, for the benefit of the movie. Um, yeah, I can see that. At least for me. And the, I don't have any complaints about the music or anything else. I think they did a good job on all that. I mean, I, like I said, if it wasn't for the story on this, I would probably give it a higher rating. I just, I, that's my biggest complaint about it. Hmm. Okay. Whoa. We can hear that. <laughs> I know. Um, any final thoughts before we go on to finish this out? No. What are, what are we reviewing next? Uh, well, I need a break from The Ring, obviously. So uh, The Devil's Backbone was what we originally planned. Uh, I feel like that's a good like palate cleanser because I, I really think that's one of Guillermo del Toro's like, best movies. One of his early movies, too, but it's like one of his better ones. Okay. <clears throat> um, and there, we don't have to worry about covering, like, there's no remake or anything like that. It'll be just straight up review of it by itself and uh, just good little creepy uh, ghost kid movie. Yeah, um, fucking and creepy after... ass looking kid. <laughs> I don't know if <laughs> and then there's a movie uh, in a similar vein that we can cover called The Changeling that's got. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, George C. Scott in it, which is what, I mean, his man, he was another good actor of his time, but I mean, it, that is another good, like, you know, creepy kid ghost film is a uh, scary movie actually references uh, the changeling. A lot of people don't realize that whole thing about the bouncing ball or whatever, coming down the steps or whatever that, that comes from the changeling. If nothing oh my else, God. cause that's like one of the scenes from it. Alrighty. So, any plugs to put in there for anything else? No, nothing. Not a whole lot. I mean, Blue Collar BS still doing their thing every Friday night out here, West Coast time, 8 p.m.-ish. So, uh, you can catch that if you want to. And, I don't know, I'm doing more Death Holler than anything else, so there's really not a Hot Mess Express to plug at the moment. (laughs) So, yeah, that's pretty much about it. 
Well, with that, peace be with you. And with your spirit. Ooh, ooh.